Good morning. Welcome in Jesus' name. This Sunday after the Ascension brings our focus to Jesus' victorious return to his native home in heaven. It proclaims to us that his mission of salvation for a sinful mankind was fulfilled, successfully completed, and our eternal salvation is secure. And so we sing our hallelujahs and praise his glorious name. Let us pray. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. Open our hearts by your Holy Spirit that through the preaching of your word we may be brought to repent of our sins, believe on Jesus in life and in death, and grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We open our service with hymn number 212, a hymn of glory let us sing. Oh, 
trusted over to tend, and with unwearied hearts are sent. Alleluia, alleluia, unto thy kingdom's throne where thou, as is our faith, are seated now. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Please follow the order of service as printed in our service bulletin. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. But we are sorry for our transgressions and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Renew us by your Spirit, and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven with boldness and confidence we may approach the throne to find grace to help in time of need. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, as your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascended into the heavens, so may we also ascend in heart and mind and continually dwell there with him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In our epistle lesson this morning, Paul outlines the wondrous blessings and glory of the ascension of our Lord Jesus. We read from the, his letter to the Ephesians, the first chapter, beginning with the 16th verse. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him 
to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Our second lesson this morning is Luke's record in the Acts of the Apostles of this glorious event of Jesus' ascension into heaven. We read from the Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter, beginning with the first verse. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all the things Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you will, shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Here ends our reading. We profess our Christian faith with the whole Christian church on earth. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing hymn 216. On Christ's ascension I now build. <laughs> Oh, 
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation on this Sunday after the Ascension is found recorded in the book of Revelation. We read in the 22nd chapter, beginning with the 12th verse. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit of the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is the word of God. Sanctify us, O Lord, through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Christ Jesus, who is our God, our risen and ascended Lord, dear fellow redeemed, we observe the glory and the wonder of Jesus' ascension. This past Thursday was actually Ascension Day. It's a church festival that's easily forgotten because we don't stop working for it or decorate the house for it or have big family gatherings on Ascension Day. We just go about our business at work or at school, and the day comes and goes without much ado. That may leave us with the impression that it is of little significance to us regarding our life and salvation. But that's hardly the case. There are a number of things that Jesus' ascension establishes for us regarding our faith and life and our hope of eternal life in heaven that awaits us. We begin with the fact that Jesus' ascension, his return to his native heaven, sends a great message of mission accomplished. 
during the 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and ascension, he appeared many times to individuals and groups of believers, and from the very first day, Jesus emphasized that the scriptures were fulfilled in him, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, and that all that was necessary for our salvation was completed in Jesus' life and death and resurrection. We are told in Luke's gospel that he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. We are told that Jesus promised that he would be with his disciples, his believers, always and everywhere, right up to the end of the age. For the fulfillment of this promise, which we treasure, it was necessary for Jesus to ascend to the right hand of God. At the right hand of God, Jesus possesses all authority in heaven and on earth. It's when we see chaos and evil in this world that we need to be assured that Jesus, who patiently deals with this sinful world according to his grace and mercy, will direct even the sin of this evil world to work for the eternal salvation of those whom he has called. You see, Jesus does respond to the evil in this world. He responds with grace and forgiveness. He responded to the sin in this evil world by dying on the cross. And he rose again and he ascended to the right hand of God where he is our advocate, interceding for us, defending us before the tribunal of divine justice, proving our righteousness before God through faith in Jesus' name, securing our deliverance from death and damnation because he has ascended into heaven also according to his human nature. Remember, he is Jesus, now and forever, true God and true man. He sympathizes with us in our weaknesses, is ever present to hear our cry and help and comfort us in our distress. As our ascended Lord, he has promised us spiritual gifts and blessings and the gift of the Holy Spirit, whom with the Father he has sent into the world. And through the Spirit's working in this world, the gospel has gone out to all nations. And we, the peoples of the Gentile nations, have come to know and believe in the one true God. And Jesus Christ, whom he sent to save us. So ultimately, we look for the Lord Jesus to return. That's the conclusion of the matter, isn't it, that we read in our, in our scripture lesson. He who went to prepare a place for us in heaven has promised that he will come again to receive us to himself in heaven. And we anticipate this coming with eagerness and great joy. In this, our final meditation in this series from Revelation on the blessings of our risen Savior, we hear him speaking to us one final time. And he speaks to us anticipating the coming of our ascended Lord. The book of Revelation itself shows how he comes to us through his word first. With all that is going on in the world these days, with all the violence, with man's inhumanity to man, with all the grief and
and pain and sorrow that people are enduring, we wonder. We wonder what Jesus would have to say about the state of this world. We wonder why the Lord doesn't respond to all this evil. We wonder when he will say, that's enough and bring down his fiery wrath and indignation upon the world. In view of all that's going on in the world, we look for the Lord's coming. And the Lord comes to us in his word in response to what's going on in all the world. That's first. That was what lay behind the Lord speaking to his church in this last book of the Bible. There was great violence in the world already then. Many Christians were suffering because of persecution. All the Christ believers were enduring the trials and tribulations of life. And they were all anxiously watching for the Lord's reappearing. The Lord Jesus came to his church in its time of need through his messenger, to encourage his church to wait patiently with understanding that the victory over death and the devil and the evil of this world, well, it has been secured. And we are to wait patiently with a sure hope of his coming on the last day. Listen again to the words of our Lord Jesus in our text in verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires let him take the water of life freely. You see, Jesus has responded to the evil in this world. He sent his angel or messenger to remind us of the truth of salvation. The salvation which he has secured through his sufferings and death as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes, God has responded to all the sin and evil in this world. He responded by sending his only begotten son as the rooted offspring of David. Jesus is that promised Messiah who was to come into the world as the rooted offspring of David. He was and is the King of kings and Lord of lords when we as children of God become distressed by the darkness of this evil world, well, we are reminded by the Lord himself that he is the bright and morning star. We're not going to find that light in this world. We are familiar with the expression that it's always darkest before the dawn. When the state of the affairs in the world look very dark indeed, when things look bleak, to say the least, we should look to the horizon and see that morning star shining brightly, piercing through the darkness of sin and death that plagues this world. Jesus shines brighter, ever brighter, with the light of our salvation. Even as we fervently pray for the Lord to come, and the Spirit joins us. The Spirit encourages us to, to continue in that prayer. Oh, come, Lord Jesus. We should also hear the Lord speaking to us. This is the time to hear his invitation to come to him in his word. We need the refreshing waters of life. Take of the waters of life freely. Receive the sacrament, hear his word, be refreshed on our journey through this, this spiritual wilderness of this world. 
With that, we will also be reassured in our anticipation of his glorious return. He will come. He will come visibly, physically, and soon. At the time of Jesus' ascension, the disciples were standing there dumbstruck, staring up into the sky where they had watched Jesus as he was received out of their sight into the clouds. They were just standing there, staring into the sky until the angels spoke up and, and told them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner, physically and visibly, as you saw him go into heaven. In our text, Jesus confirms the promise of his glorious, physical, visible return. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Every word of this confirmation of Jesus' return is significant for us Christ believers. He is coming. To us, it seems to be taking forever. But for Jesus, well, he assures us it is soon. He is coming quickly. So it's all a matter of perception of time. We see time one way, the Lord sees it quite another, doesn't it? We think of a thousand years as a very, very long time. For the Lord, it is as a day. He is coming with his reward. His reward is what has been given to him because of the great victory he secured in his death and resurrection. He defeated death, sin, the devil. He died and rose again, and his reward for that is his church. The souls of those that he first redeemed and then called to be his own through faith. And not one of them is lost. His reward is with him. This is an important comfort in the face of the violence that we see in the world. Even the violence of this past week. Those who have faith in Christ Jesus shall never perish. He has them in his hand, and they are secure in his hand. No one, not even a crazed gunman, can snatch them out of his hand. When we are reminded that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, we are being reminded that he's what life is all about. He is life itself. No one can outmaneuver him. He is the master. He's the master of the universe. We have salvation in his name. And all the evil in this world cannot change that. Those who have faith, those who live in repentance, will be saved. By his grace, we have been given the right to the tree of life. We shall live in paradise with the Lord forever. The Lord has opened the gates of heaven for all those who continue to turn away from sin and daily repent, looking to Jesus for forgiving grace as we walk that road to heaven. Now as for those who dwell in the darkness of sin, who celebrate sin, who justify violence, excusing it by their bad life, 
who rejoice in unrighteousness, who think they can get away with it or justify the evil that they practice by calling it love, by deceiving people even in the visible church with their lies, they aren't fooling God. All that stuff that makes us feel sick and disgusted, well, the Lord knows. He knows it better than we do. And he will handle it justly. No one's getting away with anything. And it isn't that the Lord is some tolerant old fool, some old uncle that is willing to give a pass to sin and evil with the wink of an eye. Jesus speaks here in language that, that we can understand. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. There's no room in heaven for the unrepentant. He equates them with mongrels, vicious, wild dogs flooding the streets, threatening harm to all they encounter. Who are those dogs that are locked out of the city of our God? They are sorcerers. Well, what are sorcerers? That is, any and all who direct people away from God to the false hopes and superstitions, the false gods of this world. The Lord has no place for them. The Lord groups all the sexually immoral together. Impenitence for sexual sins, it's common. It's everyday life in America and the rest of the world. Even some invisible Christianity would make distinctions about sins, about sin not being so bad, about people being true to themselves. As far as that excuse that some are born this way, well, we're all born corrupted by sin. We all are born in the death of sin. It's no excuse. Each and every person must repent and turn away from sin. And repentance is not about being true to oneself or one's own sinful desires. Jesus said if we are to follow him, we are to deny ourselves and take up our cross, take up our burden in this life, and then follow him. To those that came to Jesus for forgiveness, Jesus said to them, go and sin no more. Jesus has never, ever, granted anyone a license to sin. In the world, many come to people claiming to do so in Jesus' name, and they proclaim peace, peace, when there is no peace. These false teachers love and practice a lie. In their rejection of Jesus as Lord and Savior, they also lead others down the road to perdition. Not the road to heaven, the road to perdition. That's the world we live in. Now where did we begin? With Jesus' ascension into heaven. And what that means to those who believe in him. His ascension speaks to us of victory, of the victory of salvation that Jesus has secured in his death and resurrection. His ascension assures us that Jesus sits at the right hand of God with all things placed under him. Jesus' ascension speaks to us of the certainty of our ascension to everlasting life. For he who is preparing a place for us shall come again to receive us to himself. Where are we now? 
Well, now we are in this sin-corrupted world that still throws us for a loop spiritually. Sometimes when we falsely perceive that sin and death and the devil look to be winning, prevailing over the way of the Lord, but the way of the Lord is fading, and, and we find ourselves dismayed. We cry out to the Lord, and he hears our cry, and he answers with the most encouraging response. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. He has not forgotten us, much less forsaken us to this world. He who promised is faithful. He is coming. And that certainly cheers our hearts and leads us to join with the Apostle John and say, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ, most merciful, reascended Lord. We praise you, our glorious Prince and Savior, for the victory you won in our behalf over death, the devil, sin, and hell, and that you rose again from the dead to be glorified at God's right hand in heaven. From the depths of our hearts come inexpressible thanks for all that your great love and humility have done for us. You have led captivity captive, freeing us from sin and delivering us from eternal death. O everlasting King, great is our need of your love and mercy and of your continual help in these evil times. It is our confidence that if we will but seek you by faith, we shall find you, for you have promised to be always with us and to hear and answer our prayers. Therefore, be to us the complete cure for our sins, our helper in trouble, our consoler in sorrow, our relief from pain, our healer in sickness, our protector in peril, our source of supply in time of need, our deliverer in temptations, our strength for every trial and temptation, our guide in times of confusion, and finally our Redeemer from death. Be our comfort and our support until your glorious reappearing turns the yearning of our weary hearts to everlasting songs of joy. Through the Holy Spirit's gracious power and indwelling, may we give a victorious faith and hearts, may we be given victorious faith and hearts so filled with your love that we be led to live full and complete Christian lives to your praise and glory. How glorious beyond comparison it is for sinners to be able to lay claim to your promises by faith and to know that you forgive our sins, hear our prayers, fill our lives with good things, and crown our faith with eternal life. Well, count not our sins against us, but clothe us with your perfect righteousness before your Father in heaven, and intercede for us at his throne of grace. 
To you, O glorious and powerful and always gracious Lord, our Prince and Savior, be everlasting honor and praise. Amen. And we also pray in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The offering of thankful hearts will now be received. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus as stewards true receive, and gladly, as thou blessest us, to thee our first fruits give. Amen. We continue with hymn 215, Draw Us to Thee. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We sing our closing hymn. Those whom thou hast. 
Sunday school and Bible class have now entered into the summer recess. Um, so our schedule for this week, we look forward to next Sunday with worship at 9.30. The peace of the Lord be with you all.